everyone. Happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Crew Talk brought to you by Shoots.Video. I'm Sarah Marintz. I'll be your host for this evening. And tonight we are talking about location scouting. And we have a very fun panel for you. It, we're all women. This is the first time I think this is an all women panel, which is awesome. Girl power. All right. Um, so as always, uh, I have my list of questions here for the panel. And if you have any questions, you as the audience has any questions, you can throw them in the Q&A box and I will get to those towards the end of the session. Um, so hello to our panel. Thank you so much for being here this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm in Orlando, so it is evening for me. Um, so thank you for being here and thank you to our audience for tuning in. And so we have Gail, Betsy, and Robin here with us. Us. And I'm just going to jump right in with some of my questions, if that's good with you gals. And as always, whoever wants to jump in and answer first can go ahead and do that. So if one of you or all of you could explain kind of what a location scout does and explain what a location manager does, and are they ever combined into one? Uh, well, I'll go ahead and take it. A location scout you will, you'll get the call and they find the location. And then usually a location manager will work with the production company to permit and then manage the location. So it's complete. And, and I do both a lot for my clients. So the smaller the, the job, the more often that location scout and the location manager can be the same person. But, um, you know, maybe the other two can chip in as far as what they think of that concept and how that works for them. Uh, I'll go next. I, I, that's a great explanation. I'm in a smaller market. I'm, I'm in Nevada. Uh, so we cater towards commercials, music videos, uh, that type of thing. So often I am both the scout. So I'll go out, take the pictures. And then um, if it's most of the time, they will want a manager. So I'll be, you know, handling the permits, be the person to meet the police when they arrive, um, you know, handle parking, that type of thing. So I would say same thing. A lot of shoots, I end up doing both. Very rarely will someone just want me to go scout because often they're from out of town. So you're kind of that link to help them navigate the city, in my experience. Mm -hmm. and, and just to round out so that everybody who is joining the conversation I'm here not necessarily as the location scout, but as the co-founder of a marketplace where we're bringing together all of the people who need to find professional production studio spaces. So on Space for Arts, which is uh, our platform, we have a global representation of some of the most beautiful studios in the world. And so I'll be sharing with Robin and Gail about how people are getting back to work in post-COVID and what they're thinking about in terms of how to shoot in a studio versus a location and some of the concerns around that. So, okay. Well, Betsy, Betsy, you're just a location scout specifically focused on studio space. Do you look well, at your true. locations? Do you say, where, yeah. are, where, where do we plug in? <laughs> no? Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, that's scouting, right? Yes, I. If the, there are so many people, like uh, the industries that ring me are entertainment, editorial, fashion, retail, brands, um, advertising. I get creative directors and art directors and photo editors calling me all the time, and so yes. Um, when it comes to indoor space, I'm good, or a rooftop space. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So how do you break into locations, location scouting? Like, How do you get into that? I could go first just how I got started. Um, you know, mine was a little organic. I started producing still uh, shoots for um, an agency called Getty and they did lifestyle. So they were smaller shoots. So I would do the casting. I would do the locations, um, typically, you know, smaller crews. And that was, you know, 15 years ago, maybe, maybe even longer actually. Um, and then from there, you know, after probably about six or seven years, I, I started getting calls from other producers wanting me to do the same thing just because they wanted to come to Las Vegas. So after that, then I started working with other scouts that were here in Las Vegas and then, it, you know, worked for them, finding locations and, you know, then started slowly getting larger shoots from that, managing my own shoot. So it was it's, you know, slow learning the process of scouting. 
um, from production. So, you know, kind of seeing what a shoot entails first and then finding, oh, I will, I really love just doing locations. I actually got into locations a little differently. I was working as a production assistant in San Francisco or in Sacramento, and I'd been working for everything that I could, right? So I was doing sports and commercials and documentaries and anything I can get my hands on. And um, production assisting is hard, and I was looking for something, and I really didn't know what it was at that point. But then one of the local production companies had fired their uh, location scout, <laughs> and I got lucky, and they called me. And I went in the next day, and they hired me, and that's how I learned. They taught me how to scout. They taught me how to manage. They taught me how to literally line produce a commercial. And that was my real big break in the business. And from there, I kind of moved up from being a PA into that next level. Awesome. That's I think that helps, Robin, doesn't it? When you're on the, the ground floor and as you move up through the ranks, it's all that wisdom and experience that gets you to the top of your field. You know, it's without building all those bricks ahead of time. It's yeah. literally like a patina. That's how I look yeah. at it. Yeah. It's like an old painting. You wonder, how did that painting get so cool? It's because they put a lot, of, a lot of patinas on it. They just over and over layered something on it. And that's what this business is like for all of us. Every time we go out for a job, we're patining, we have a patina that happens. And we get wiser and better at what we do, we hope. <laughs> you know? Um, so, uh, Yeah. It does help to come from the bottom, actually, because I can find my way around a sports uh, place, no problem, right? Because I've been into so many, and I did that as a PA. I was utility and tape, tape replay for seven years. So, yeah, it does help to have all of that different experience, Absolutely, I think. Absolutely. No, I would agree. And so when you're starting out, like – how do you begin? Like when you're scouting, like how do you begin? Like what is the process? Gail, you want to take it? I'll start. So for me, um, you know, I always get it. Well, first of all, get as much information as you can, which sometimes people don't, you know, they're not as forthcoming, but really, you know, that would start with, um, you know, finding out from the client what their budget is, you know, what their restraints are. What I try to do is find out, you know, what are the, where can I go budget wise? What, you know, like how far out, you know, can I travel with this crew? Um, you know, look at logistically what they're trying to shoot and then, you know, kind of problem solve. So, I mean, I'll think of everything, even if things, I'll try to be as broad as I can and not eliminate locations. And then, um, but I do like to find out, you know, sort of to make their shoot, someone shoot successful, you can't just propose to go film anywhere. Um, and I think that's maybe misunderstood. I don't know if this is misunderstood, but I don't know for me, that's where I'm coming from because I want them to have a successful shoot. So I don't want to start looking at the wrong places. Um, but I do try to be broad. And then from there, um, you know, I'll just throw the widest net I can, um, of a location I think will be good for them, uh, to fit their needs. And then, um, so it's mostly a lot of research. So that starts on the computer, um, it could be how far out something is. It could be, you know, a certain architectural style I'm looking for, or if it's outside, you know, or what type of landscape they're looking for. Um, so that's just kind of how I try and narrow down and, and just a lot of computer research first before I do reach out. So it's very similar for me. You get the call. The first thing I want to know is when's the shoot? How much time do I have? That's really key for me. Because if they don't give me enough time, I can't pull permits. And if I'm not pulling permits, I'm not doing the job. So, it, you know, that's the first thing. If, if we're all good and the time is okay, then if, if they have locations, if they can send me some kind of an idea, if they can do a little research and say, I want an alley. Well, can you send me a picture of the kind of alley you like? There's the second thing that I like to get from the client if I can. Um, and it really depends on the client. For instance, um, I had a client back in 2015 that wanted a Chinese mining camp because they were doing a documentary on the Chinese that came over and they wanted it one hour outside of San Francisco. 
And I knew that did not exist. And they wanted a cave. They had these specific things. They wanted a Western town, you know, a Chinese town. <clears throat> so I didn't turn the job down. I actually went out and tried to find what they wanted within an hour. And when I couldn't, I called the San Mateo Film Commissioner who put me in touch with the Placerville, Placer County Film Commissioner. Film commissioners are really big in my book. If I can't find something or if I'm looking for something, that's the first thing I do is call a film commissioner. And she had everything. Beverly Lewis up in Placer County had not only a Chinese mining camp, she had a raging river, which is not on their, on their list, but they needed. Their list was incomplete. You have to kind of sometimes think about, like, when they send you the information, you have to go through, because a lot of times they'll miss what they, what they need. They'll be in such a hurry. They completely forgot they need a river. So we had everything. We had the entire thing, and they moved the shoot from San Francisco up into Placer County, and we had two weeks up there, and... I won the COLA award for that particular shoot because like Gail said, you try not to put too many no's up there. Yeah. Sometimes you can kind of delve in and then change it. And if, if it's the right thing, they'll take it. It always starts with the computer. I never go out immediately and get in my car unless it's a, a known location. Uh, so it's usually a half a day on the computer setting up appointments. I go through, I have a database I have probably like 3,000 locations on my database. I'll go through that first and then put, uh, you know, feelers out to all my friends and stuff. Hey, guys, I'm looking for this. Everybody knows what I do. And we go from there. And money is important also. Yeah. <laughs> Betsy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, it's – okay, so – I was going to ask the ladies, do they ever ask you to shoot in a studio space? Or when you say location, it's almost exclusively not inside, not in a shoot space, like a production studio. They do for me. I don't know about you, Gail. Uh, they do. It's not as common here in Nevada. We don't have a lot of sound stages. I feel like people that are coming to film, you know, in Las Vegas is where I live. They're coming here for... Um, specifically because of the locale. So if they're really looking for this studio, they'll, you know, they're going to be shooting in New York or LA. Um, <laughs> what I will get is we're, we're having a shoot and then they, for some reason, they need something in studio and they'll ask, you know, is there somewhere we could go in for a few hours and, and get these shots? That's, you know, typically here. Yeah. I, and around entertainment, we get that a lot. You know, they're, they're shooting, on a soundstage or on location and then they need to take the talent and go shoot, you know, headshots or whatever. So usually there's this moving entity. Um, but I'll, I, last week I got a call from a production company in London because they're doing the 20th anniversary of nine 11 and I need a warehouse. <laughs> well, you know, it's okay. What's your budget? How many days? Um, what kind of warehouse, you know, a creepy warehouse, warehouse with pillars, you know, wood floor. I mean, so similar to how you guys approach, um, but it's a building and obviously there are parameters, but it's, it's fascinating because the client thinks warehouse, but that could be a lot of different things because we have beautiful spaces that have, you know, floor to ceiling windows and it's got pillars in it and all kinds of crazy natural light and the sound is great, you know, so it doesn't, so it's, it's just fascinating. You have to work with the client. You have to ask them a million questions. Okay, hone it down for me. And then, of course, we've worked really hard for the last two years on pulling all these different resources together on our platform. And then I'll reach out to all the studios. Do you have availability? And I'll give them a dozen, maybe sometimes 20 options. And they go bananas. It's like, oh, my God, it's all in one place. This is great. So it's a similar process to you, ladies. Um, it's just space as, a, as opposed to being, you know, that I need a Chinese back alley or whatever in Chinatown. Um, so I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Robin, you mentioned permits. How important is it to have a permit? Like how important is permitting? And, you know, it, it depends, I think, on where you're at. Certainly the Bay Area, you don't move in this town without a permit. And one day I went to the, the local film commission, this guy named Mike was running it, and I was complaining to him, gosh, you know, I'm here, and if my crew just takes three steps here, we're on a different place. We're in a city park now. Or now we're on um, GGNRA, Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Or now we're on a county park. I said, 
why can't you guys make a map and color code it and make it easy for us? And then he looked right at me and said, and then why would I need you? <laughs> and we all laughed. It's very complicated here. It really is. And you have to have a permit. If somebody says they don't want to shoot without a permit, it's really for the insurance. So as a location scout, location manager, sometimes producer, if I take a client and they're not pulling the insurance, says something happens, guess who's in trouble, right? So I don't know about Las Vegas or I'm pretty sure New York and, and the East Coast is, is um, permit savvy. But I wanted to add the other thing that really does affect, I don't, I don't know about Las Vegas and you guys out there in the East, but what we're shooting. Because sometimes I work for crime shows. So we're going to shoot a murder. You have, to, you have to tell the people what you're shooting in their home. There's always a great curiosity for that. And sometimes you have some sensitive things, and that can, can be more difficult to get a location for, to confirm a location. So I mean, I would agree. I think that you started at some point saying, I won't uh, do a shoot unless, you know, I'm pulling the permits. I mean, it's the same here. You pretty much, I mean, there's really, I can't think of anywhere – if you're in a private home, you don't technically need a permit, but you would need it for parking. Um, you still, if I were to approach a home, there's no way I would ever do that without insurance. getting a certificate of insurance. Um, it's just it's unethical um, yeah. to do anything otherwise. And, you know, even here are city streets. Um, you know, if you're a crew of five or more, uh, you know, you still have to have a permit. I mean, I really think the only, and it's, maybe the only thing that's excluded maybe is I, you know, I don't work with them or maybe like the news broadcast or something like that. Um, you know, that go out. I, I don't know how they handle that, but, uh, you know, pretty much if you're filming here, you really, you really should have a permit, um, you know, for your crew's safety and then also for, you know, your city's safety. Um, so yeah. I will say this, there's a real difference between just what Gail said, broadcast. So like I work for a uh, cable a lot. I used to work for like Dream Builders, you know, those kind of food shows, the Food Network, mm -hmm. Extra, Entertainment Tonight, all of those shows, we don't pull permits. And it's usually three people, and usually we don't put sticks on the ground unless it's just really quick. And sticks on the ground is kind of the rule here. If you've got sticks on the ground, you should be having a permit. So we, 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 we don't pull for those kind of jobs. But if it's a crew of five or more, just like Gail said, they're looking for permits. What are the challenges of permitting? Time. Time, 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 and, yes. and subject matter. Okay. And um, bad rangers at parks that don't want to do the job because they really don't want to film crew there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone in that comment. I thought that oh was just gosh. our part here. Okay. Yeah, the evil laugh. We can. <laughs> I have to say, I've had some trouble with that, and I usually just go right above their head, and then they hate me forever, but I don't care because I go above their head again. They're working for me. That's how I look at it. Right. They're working. They're working. If this is, if this, I'm, this is not a favor you're doing me. This yeah. is business. And so I do get more respect when I do that. I don't often have to do that. Usually people are very, but yes, Gail. Yes. Uh, you know, in Nevada, we're actually, our permits take a lot longer. Um, I, what, is I, it, what is it? How much? So, I mean, just in, um, you know, Clark County, if it's a simple permit, it's at least five days. Wow. Um, if you want anything with police, like if you need, you know, let's say you wanted to have, um, you know, over five people on a sidewalk and you need some, uh, some police with you. That's at least 14 days. And that's working days. Wow. Um, and a lot of our parks now are 30. So wow. I know because it's shocking, you know, I'll get a lot of productions from LA and it's, so I, I do believe, you know, obviously it's going to be a whole different era of permitting, but I believe that, you know, we, we just have smaller staff in our business offices to, to do the permits. So definitely take some lead time here. What's the hardest location you've ever found? Wow. I have one. Okay, what would that be? I'm sorry. I, I, 
I, I, I know your stories are going to trump this one. Oh, but. come on. Don't say that, Betsy. You don't know that. <laughs> um, so, I, again, another London production company. I need to put a car on a roof with a view of the Veronzano Bridge, and it cannot be a parking garage. And the car is a prop. So it has to be in the shot. Okay, really? Wow. I found it. <laughs> I found it. That, do you guys know um, Ocean's 8, the movie with Santa yeah. Bola, mm-hmm. That one? And there was a shot in Red Hook outside um, this studio complex. And it actually was an old shipping building. And it has this just this crazy structure. And they have gigantic, you know, freight elevators and sure enough, you can get the thing, great view, but uh, that, that took some doing. That was like, wow, how am I going to get this done? So anyway, that's my story. So did, you say, did it go up with a crane or no? It went all the way up with... No, uh, it went in the road. It went up the, the, right up. the lift that they had. Yeah. Wow. That's, so, that is some coordinating. It was some coordinating. It was. Yeah. I was very proud of myself. <laughs> that was hard. Oh, I have two locations I want to talk about. The first one was I had to shut the Bay Bridge down for a Kaepernick drive in a Jaguar. Excellent. Wow. <laughs> and so we're dealing with a couple of different things. And the, and the client calls me. I'm on my way out of town to shoot a, a, a cattle branding up in Humboldt. I got a job up there, and I'm like, I don't have time. He says, call me Monday. It's just a quick shoot, I promise. I call him Monday, and it went from a one-day shoot to a three-day shoot, and we want to close the Bay Bridge. And I said to him, you don't, we don't have time to do that. We have to bump the shoot. So he bumped it a day, and I immediately got the paperwork in. And it, it was a nightmare, uh, but we ended up getting it. Uh, and we didn't do a full stop. We did what they call as a rolling stop on the bridge. So the cops just kind of stopped everybody for 15 minutes. Wow. And I've got this footage of us driving down the Bay Bridge. It's completely empty. And there's Kaepernick in the Jaguar. We got all this great stuff. It's up on my website if you want to see it. And that was a really tough, just like you, Betsy, a lot of coordination. And we went through the streets of San Francisco with him in that Jaguar and, and what, I don't know, 40 police officers? It was insane. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. And the other one was, oh, I got a client for um, Reagan, John Hinckley, the documentary about John Hinckley. Oh, wow trying to kill Reagan, and they needed a 1970s Circa house for Hinckley's parents, so it needed to be upscale. Who has an upscale 1970s house? I mean, nobody. We're talking orange carpet, wood paneling, white enamel, fireplace. You know that look. The 70s. Everybody's gotten rid of all of that. I'm like, why don't you go to a studio and rebuild it? You know, there's no way. And I found it. And I found it through my club. I'm, a, I'm an open water swimmer and I belong to a club and I put it out to my club and three days later, I had that location. That's amazing. Gail? Um, I would say mine uh, would probably be, I worked on a, a shoot for Prada, similar to, is a rooftop issue um, where we, um, we shot, uh, it's, it's called Fremont East. Um, so the model was going to be in this bar, which had, it was pretty much glass, but you would still see down into the street, which is a, you know, like a bar district. And then the director said, well, you know, part of the, the concept of the shoot was to have these neon signs they had built and they were going to bring in. And, um, you know, they were beautiful. They were very well done. You know, this is real, you know, neon. It's not, you know, it's Prada. So they do a very good job. And then, and then he, we were out together. He goes, you know, I really, I want this sign now on the roof right over, you know, somewhere has to be somewhere on that building. Well, these are some of the oldest buildings in Las Vegas in this, you know, area. So we just had to basically knock on all the doors, but first get, get someone to allow us to do it. And then, um, you know, structurally check the roofs because no one had their building plan. So we couldn't say, you know, we have a, you know, 500, 2000 pound sign, we'll crane it up. Is that okay? So you get to check the, the load bearing of the roof. Um, and then, you know, sure enough, the, the one guy did allow us to put it up there. Um, the other thing in Vegas, when we get rooftop requests, a lot of our roofs are, they have just small entry portals. They're not, you know, accessible. Mm-hmm. You just kind of go up to the roof. They're flat. Um, so that we did have to crane, you know, kind of shut down, crane it up from the front 
<coughs> up the street, um, which, you know, the business is, it's, it's, you know, a little hard to get convincing of all of that and, and, you know, stopping pedestrians so they don't walk into the sign going up and things like that. So, uh, you know, that probably was the hardest, just the install of it and then getting the permission of the, the bars around to do it. Wow. Those yeah. are, uh, those are some crazy stories. Some interesting stories. I'm sure you guys could tell stories all day about the locations that you've had to find. Um, so what is the COLA award? I think California on about. locations award. It's the California, uh, puts this award on once a year. And the, here's the best part about the COLA award. Super exciting. I had no idea. The film commissioners have to read about you. So they all know you. Excellent. Humboldt County Film Commission knows me. Sacramento County knows me. LA knows me. They, when Robin Kincaid comes across their desk, they've heard about me. And that's a really big plus because I use the film commissioners a lot. I got, I got that from um, Gold Mountain, which was that documentary from the Chinese mining camp. And the film commissioners, uh, Beverly Lewis, nominated me for that award. Uh -huh. And the funny is about like two months later, I get this call. I'm coming down 37. I'm coming back from a shoot in Sacramento. I even know what the shoot was. That's how memorable this was. And I get a call. And this woman comes on. Hello, this is Robin. She says, uh, hi, Robin. This is so-and-so from the award center. And I hang up on her. She calls me back. Robin, don't hang up. I'm like, what are you? I don't want an award. I don't want any hotel rooms. I don't want any free trips. <laughs> I don't want any. She says, this is with the film commission, Robin. I almost blew it right out of the gate. And that was just for the nomination. I had to go down to Santa Monica and they had all the red carpet and I went up against all of the location managers in LA. Gail, that was really intimidating, I have to say. I'm just saying that was, but I won. Congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. I had to now, go they up there and do it. Do they have awards like that for like Las Vegas or I guess Nevada and, and in New York as well? Not here. There's another award though, which I think is national through the guild. Is that correct? Or there's one other, I mean, I think there's another a location award, but no, there's not something specific here in, in Nevada. For each state. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very cool. Well, congratulations. That's, that Thank you so that's much. amazing, Robin. <laughs> well, that actually started the course because I would have never written this course and done this PA course if I wasn't like now that I'm an expert in my field it gave me a platform to actually build something that can help these kids get into film I wish I'd have had any instruction at all would have been very helpful to me as a PA and so that one thing led to the other which was super exciting very cool. We're going to shift gears and um, talk about how COVID is affecting things on set. So how will COVID-19 affect your shoot and what types of perimeters and risk assessment should you be thinking about as you look for a location or studio? Space for the Arts has developed its first round of coronavirus safety on set protocols. Um, yes, all in, it's always in development as uh, you get yeah, back yeah. to work and learn. And I'm sure you can talk a bit more about that Betsy uh, and I know probably Gail and Robin can as well because as all of everyone who's on this chat and everybody who is out there as we all know every single day and every single week things are evolving things are changing different organizations are coming out with their white papers or their specific set of protocols AICP has a set of protocols in a white paper um, you know, it's, there, there are just so many. We were early out of the starting gate. We, um, we partnered up with Art of Freelance, which is Matthew Young in um, Los Angeles. He, he runs a freelance course. And we partnered with an infectious disease doctor. And we just started writing about what is pre-production going to look like? What's production going to look like? What's post-production going to look like? Um, and some of the things that immediately became obvious. Not so many crew members on set, right? So how are we going to socially distance? How are we going to keep ourselves healthy? Um, what are ways that we can work remotely? Uh, you know, all the video technology, um, using Capture One, you know, having people check in on set um, remotely is really important. Um, 
But then again, if you're on a big soundstage or you're on location, I've heard, I guess there was a film shoot in um, Iceland. I think it was Iceland where they gave everybody um, in, you know, whatever your, your job was on set, everybody had different wristbands, uh, you know, like those bungee wristbands and everybody had a different color. So, you know, if, if, and only the people with blue could go all the way around the set so that it kept everybody safe. Um, obviously personal protective equipment. And this is the biggest, I think in Robin and Gail are going to talk about this. Yes, we understand the necessity of wearing a mask, but how is the talent going to wear a mask through the entire production? Or if your hair and makeup, how's that going to work? You know, it's, at some point you, you have to finish the makeup. So there are a lot of us are, there's a lot of anxiety around how are we going to get our job done? Um, I know for studio spaces, I'm begin, you know, just starting to get back to work in New York last Monday and people are looking for multiple studio spaces with a rooftop and they're doing pre-production um, in one studio. Um, and then when the production comes in, you know, some people are in studio one and then the shoots are going in studio two and then they're going up to the rooftop deck you know, just to get some air and some ventilation. Um, studio spaces themselves, what are the things that are people are looking for is not every studio has their own personal bathroom. You have to go to the building bathroom. And so just using the bathroom and staying safe in terms of making sure that you're cleaning and is there ventilation in the bathroom, yeah. using the elevator, right? People mm. are worried, like, if I go up in the elevator and somebody has COVID and then I get in at the top floor and go down, mm. am I going to get it, you know, and washing your hands in the elevator. So there's actually a protocol for using the elevator, if you can believe it. Um, studios, the, changing their filters in their HVAC, buying ozone machines, um, fans, you know, it's ventilation is huge when you're shooting in an indoor space, just keeping the air moving, just opening a window makes a big difference. So I've, I've spoken too much, but those that off the top of my head, those are, those are the things that are rattling around. And then as far as the crew is concerned, rotating the crew, like, you know, okay, you're coming in from, you know, six to three, and then we're going to shoot from three to nine. Um, and then I've also heard where productions last week, they used families, you know, they've all, work together out, you know, they've already been together and quarantined together. So if they, you know, if they need little kids, they're going to bring in the model and have their kids on the shoot. Um, and then they're also keeping that same crew for different shoots, just quarantine for 14 days. And then we'll, sh we'll use you again. So just people thinking about things in a different way. Anyway, I'm passing the baton. As talent, I know, um, uh, they had me go in and audition with my fiance for a few things. He's not an actor, but they, that's what they've been doing. It's like, you're going with your family. Um, or they asked my brother who's in, he does model in Chicago, but they were like, can your brother come? I mean, it is a different way of doing so different. Um, but Definitely. yeah, it's a uh, shooting with family. Uh, shooting, right. Yeah. It's amazing. Very different. I've heard that they actually will um, take a full crew uh, and I don't know if this has happened or they're planning on it. This comes from Debbie Brubaker. Where well, they're just going to take a full crew and put them in a hotel for two weeks. You quarantine them out. They do the job. And then you go. You never get out. You go back to the hotel room at night. You go to bed. And that's for movies. That's, I think, what they're thinking about for movies. She's right. Betsy is right. The rules and the different rules are going to be super confusing. I wish they just had one, but they don't. San Francisco has some rules. The Guild has some rules. Everybody's going to have their rules. I think it's basically ventilation. It comes down to it and masks and cleaning, cleaning people. I bet they're going to be cleaning people on every job now. Yep. Go through and, and, and wipe everything down all the time. It's going to affect craft services in a really big way. Yeah. Um, it's going to affect who's on the set and, and it'll affect space on a set. So instead of having video yeah. village, you would have everybody in their home. Maybe the, the director's at home uh, on zoom, just like we're doing right here. And he can yeah. see exactly what they're shooting. Does he really need to be on the set or she? Yeah. Maybe yeah. not. Um, you probably have 
more people who <clears throat> are younger doing more menial tasks than the older people. I don't know. I have, I, you know, it's just going to be very interesting. They'll, they'll pick exterior locations. Maybe they'll do more stuff without talent. I don't know. It will be a problem until they figure this out. Uh, yeah. I, and um, some people are choosing. So as the rush came back last week, um, food and wine said, uh, you know, we had this shoot and it was going to be in somebody's home and we just, we, I, we can't go in there, you know? And so Betsy, find me a shooting kitchen that has a rooftop, you know? Um, so that I'm finding that, I don't think this is going to last long term though. I, and Robin and Gail, you can speak to this. I mean, certainly there's a lot of confusion and you're going to have to follow state and local guidelines. Look, we've got studios, you know, in London and Berlin and Amsterdam and Greece, you know, you know, the first thing the crew does is they, you know, touch down and they've got to check out what are the guidelines in this country. Um, and I think it's going to take a good year of shooting and trying to figure out what's important and what isn't. Meaning as they get to know more and more about COVID, right now we're all panicked. It's like, oh my God, we, you know, yeah. we're all going to wrap ourselves in bubble wrap to, to, do, to do our job. Um, I think it'll calm down, but I think the one thing that everybody in our industry needs to understand, and this is, goes for any job in any industry, COVID's going to be around for a while. Yeah. It's not going away. And safety um, has to come first. If, if people start getting sick on shoots, yeah, mm -hmm. it'll be. Uh, what's amazing to me is I see people in the Bay Area and they're driving in their car alone with their mask on, which is super unhealthy. The mask needs to come off unless you're around other people because it's really, I'm a body worker. It's really bad to be breathing in your own facial stuff like that all the time. It's not healthy. <laughs> so people are completely freaked out, Betsy. You're, you're right. They're just... Yeah, it's a lot. And one of the things we are doing is we, I can't really talk about it on this webcast because it's still in development, but we're aligning ourselves. I don't want to be an island in the world of COVID, meaning I want Space for Arts to take a leadership role and partner and collaborate with other leaders in the photo film industry and come up with some basic white paper kind of guidelines that you know, it's not so specific that it's like, I have to read 32 pages of this one and 59 pages of this one. We want to make, I want to become a leader, but I don't want to be an island. And I want to come up with things that are rational across studios, across locations for crews um, and come up with something that everyone can follow. You know, it's, it, it's so everyone can take a leadership role when it's possible in your in your town or in your industry or whatever. Um, because I think this is, this is really throwing our industry for a loop. Yeah. Um, in the world for a loop. And, you know, we all have to get back to work, but that somehow combining so that, I mean, one of the things I'm worried about for the studios, we have over 600 studios on our website. Everyone's doing something different. People are spending way too much money. You know, they're buying an ozone machine and then they're doing it. And it's like, Oh, um, and when you think about that, the, the budgets themselves are going to explode, yes. right? It's like, yes. what do we need to do? What do we have to do? What do we want to do? You know, there's sort of, you got to live in that land. Um, but the bottom line, and I hope, every, I hope if anything, if you take away from this web, webinar, is that you have to, you don't want to put someone back on set where they have to decide, I need the work because I need to get paid or am I putting my life at risk? And that is insanity. You know, the, there's just, no one should have to do that. And so I hope our industry comes together. We should be having these webinars and webcasts to talk about COVID, to talk about how to get back to work safely, because we're going to be dealing with this for at least the next 18 months, because right now only 5% of our population has been infected. And in order for herd immunity to happen, 60 or 70% of us have to get sick or had it 60 to 70%. And we're, we're already in this for four months and it's only 5%. So we're in this together for a while. Do you, you think there were the anxiety? It's like, oh, yeah. 
Do you think there will be like a checklist on set, like a COVID-19 kind of checklist yeah. on sets or in studios? Yeah. And I, and I think there's a lot of people, I just uploaded a health questionnaire in my, you know, on our website, I have like the blue band and COVID and I, I keep putting resources in there. You know, people probably are going to have to take a health questionnaire before they show up. And then the day they show up for production, take the health questionnaire again, you know, yes, no, yes, no. Um, Temperatures will be taken on set. Yep. Um, here's the problem. The problem is that there's no enforcement. There is no leadership in this country oh, no. about this right now. This is a huge issue. There's nothing coming from the top. So we're down here scrambling exactly. and trying to figure out what to do. And there's no enforcement either. And so the enforcement will come through lawsuits. I just heard from my insurance guy. They've got, he's got a COVID, <clears throat> a COVID um, release. He says, this is junk. Liability waiver. <laughs> you, you cannot sign away your rights. And your safety, it's against the law. So this is just doesn't, it doesn't do anything. You just have to sue once you go in, but this doesn't work against you. But people don't know that. And so I think, I think Betsy's right. I think we're going to be scrambling for a little bit. But I also do believe, because we are who we are, we, we move quick, man. We're like, we eat <laughs> stuff fast. That's right. And we don't have a no button. No, we have a no how button. much button. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I will, I, I want to, Robin, you're so right about the, the life. You, you can't sign your life away. Nobody should be signing that. I, I second, third, fourth, and fifth that. However, what they do know about COVID is that it's a 14 day incubation period. There is no way that anyone can get on set if it's like, you know, one day, two day, three day, and then they go on to another job. It's going to be very hard to prove because it's a 14 day incubation period. They could have had it before they got to set or they could have gotten it after they got to set. How are you going to prove that that three days of the 14 was because of that? We don't have the system in America right. to right. set up this kind of tracing, I guess you would call it, right? Yeah, so it's contact like, tracing, yeah. Yeah, this is our... our our pro it is a big problem. I really don't have an answer to be honest with you. It's a tough one. It is. And I, it's really hard. We are not the kind of people to go under. Heck we have people who won't wear face masks in public. Like, you know, yeah, they refuse. It's that's how stubborn we are as a people. We're not going to just get in line and do what, what the right thing is. And so this is going to be, uh, it's going to be yeah. with us for a while, Betsy, though. I agree with you on that. And I think that, um, yeah. I just, I don't know. <laughs> the other thing is what happens when the talent, like, you know, Sarah, um, or a crew member shows up their pre-production health qu questionnaire, no problem. Take the temperature, 102 fever. You've got to go home. Are you paying them? And what happens to the shoot? If it's the, uh, if it's the primary, do you cancel the shoot? I, I, these are, I'm, I don't have answers, but the more we talk about this and the more we have these kinds of webinars and conversations, that's well, the whole checklist thing. Like as an industry, we need to have a checklist and we need to agree what are the protocols? Because right now we're all like, I don't know. We, but we're, I don't know if we can ever agree like you're, and it, maybe we shouldn't agree. Las Vegas is different. The right. area. So I was going to say, I mean, I'm kind of in the same, what I think is going to happen here is that whatever, so if it's a commercial and it's AICP or, you know, it, I believe that what's going to happen is a production company is going to say, these are, these are the guidelines we're working with. Um, it start, as far as like our permitting here, it's, a, it's aligned with the, the opening phase of the governor. So, you know, technically no one should be filming here if there's over 50 people or applying for a permit, it's going to be denied. Um, but I really think it's going to be where it's, it's going to come from the, the industry, whatever industry you're working under that the guidelines will come from. Um, yeah. I am, I just started on a job. Um, most of it's outside scouting. So um, that was interesting. I actually just started this week. I would say that the, the most interesting thing is, you know, obviously I've been wearing a mask to a grocery store and that kind of thing, but it's very hot here. Um, 
And so I did notice I, I was doing a lot of uh, walking on the strip and actually no one was there. So I felt comfortable not having my mask on. Um, but anytime I would go, uh, there's egresses where you have to go inside. So I'd put the mask, you know, back on, or, you know, if there was any people around me, um, and you know, it got very tiring. Um, so I do wonder the second day I went out, I was inside and, you know, I think it was, uh, it was, I wasn't faced with that many issues because where I was scouting is actually still closed. So it was a huge, huge hotel that was closed. Um, I was, you know, I mean, imagine a huge hotel and there's two people in a, in a restaurant, you know, and so we were not anywhere near each other. We had a mask on, so I really didn't have a concern. Um, but when I was done and I probably was only up there two hours, I mean, I, I needed to go in my car, take my mask off and take a break before I went. Um, it was later in the day. So walking outside, I did, I felt like I had to wear my mask. Um, there was enough people in the, on the sidewalks, but it was pretty tiring. So I do wonder, you know, somewhere here where you're dealing with heat or, you know, anywhere, is there going to be like time for breaks that people can go or need somewhere to go to, to just, you know, take the mask off? Um, I, I was a little surprised at how difficult it was. Um, I agree. You know, or maybe that's just the lunch break. I, you know, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Um, yeah, one of, one of the productions um, that we had in the South, um, the, it was just the production company. Um, at, every two hours, they were allowed to get off set, take their mask off, go have a glass of water, walk around. Okay. And it was in the contract that, you know, because they were worried. I mean, people, it's hot and you can't breathe and you're sweating and it's, yeah. Hard. But I think maybe that's going to, I mean, I don't know if that's going to be an overall, I think that's kind of a case by case situation. If you're shooting in Iceland, you know, as opposed to Miami, it's going to be different, but right. I totally agree. You know, I've had to be on set with that face mask and it's horrible. Yeah. It's, it's horrible. It's, I can't breathe with the mask. I've tried all kinds of different masks. Yes. Um, I don't know. Uh, some people have more problem with it. I, I get claustrophobic in general. I'm, I have claustrophobia a little bit, so the mask is not... I haven't had to work yet. I did do a photo shoot last week um, for a headshot, and I wore the mask the whole time. Uh, and But I got into my camera, and I didn't... You know, like, I, I was gone. That was it. How do you but, think scouting will be different in, um, you know, during COVID-19, like with wearing the mask? And I know, Gail, you said it was difficult and you needed to take a break. Um, do you think it's going to change a lot of things in terms of scouting? Uh, I think so. I mean, even for that, I, I had, I mean, obviously, in Vegas, I always have appointments. It's pretty much illegal to just, you can't really get to, um, you can't really bring cameras to a lot of these places without getting shut down to take photos. Mm -hmm. um, but having appointments... I was, even though I was just scouting, I was brought in through the employee entrance. I was given a health questionnaire and I, my temperature was taken. So, um, you know, that's going to be common. I think, uh, if it's a larger business, I think, you know, that could be expected, um, that you're going to be asked those questions. And I've, I had a few people that normally I would have gone to do a site visit. Um, and I just ended up saying, you know, can you just send me your marketing pictures? Um, that can be problematic because, you know, scouting is actually for like, for in this instance, we're looking for a view. There could be different tints on the windows. And when people do marketing images, they often are nothing like the location. So that you're really just to go in and say, okay, you know, could they, can you even see out the window or is that just Photoshop? Um, so that's a little difficult, but I, in two instances on the shop I'm on, I said, you know, if I hadn't already been in there, they just sent marketing pictures. Um, and then the other places that were outside, I felt comfortable enough to go, Re, you know, rescout it. So I think less access. I think less access, more time mm -hmm. for pulling permits. I think um, more time for pre pro. I think more exterior shoots. I think so, at some point somebody will figure out what exactly the aerosol is needed in a room to make it safe. That could be a big thing, Betsy. Yeah. If they could figure that out, like I've got one of these air air freshener things. Yeah. I was reading the other day, the mask is only good for 10 to 20 minutes inside. After that, it doesn't do any good. Now, that's that's from a doctor. And yeah, so but that, 
But you have to calculate, okay, is it completely stagnant and there's no airflow? That's it, my point exactly. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. Exactly. There's right. so many other factors. Well, that, he's talking about like in a grocery store. He was okay. really, so that's why they're saying get in and get out. Don't spend an hour in the store. Exactly. It's not like they've got fans blowing and windows no. open, and, you know. So I think whatever. once they figure out the tra- trajectory of how this works and they yeah. can get some machines in the rooms, yeah. we'll be able to actually, it's going to take a little time, but we haven't figured it out yet, but we will. We will. We it, will. It's true. And that's why people are buying these ozone machines. Some people are buying, you know, ultraviolet lights. Um, it, anything that kills a virus in the air, basically. Uh, yeah, anything. And so, yeah, I think they're going to figure that out pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for us, wow, I mean, scouting just ended because, you know, editorial entertainment. They're not sticking people on an airplane and saying, yeah, go to New York and go scout you know, that's recently. done. That's just like over in our industry, in, in the studio, at least, at least the way I'm looking at it. Like nobody's sending anybody from Lo- like the lady in London who's doing the nine 11. She trusts me that, you know, I've got some 3d videos or I can put her in touch with the studio owner and they can zoom like literally with the laptop. They're just going to, you know, walk around. Um, so thank you zoom. But I think the technology aspect, you know, are directing remotely, scouting remotely, you know, in a space is, is potentially, um, potentially can be successful. And again, everybody's experimenting. I mean, we're just getting back to work. So we'll see. Knock on wood. I want to just quickly mention that if anyone who's watching has any questions to pop them in our chat box, and I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, one more question here. What technologies are available to use so that you can shoot with your clients remotely with smaller crews? I know Zoom is one thing you were just talking about to kind of scout, but is there anything else? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, for the most part, people are using Zoom just because of the account. I mean, you know, you could FaceTime, you could you know, go through Facebook, but I think zoom with their audio and and having multiple people, um, it's pretty reliable right now. And I think people are at least some of the food photographers I know, um, they use capture one, um, as their technology for, um, working with the art directors and, you know, they're on zoom and they're using capture one, you, you, you match them. And so, you know, they're moving the set around and moving all the different shots and they can be there real time. But I, I defer to the other ladies. Um, well, the, the only thing I wait. saw that might help is um, um, machines that hold the camera. So you don't even need the DP. The DP is not on the set anymore. Uh, the camera is now on a motorized arm thing. Looks like <laughs> the future. I like that dog in Singapore is what I like. You see that dog in Singapore walking around looking at people. I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see some motorized things. We're going to see more drones. Yeah. We're going to see more machines um, moving into and people uh, using ways to control those machines, controllers. Gail, do you have anything to add? I would agree. I, you know, it's not um, the only other, I know there are some technologies that um, directors and people will be using for clients. Uh, You know, I don't have the names to kind of mention, but I know on other, um, you know, I could source it out and send it to you later. I I do think there's some technology for, you know, live feed when they're actually filming as far as scouting and things. I, I can imagine for us, I mean, really zoom or just something that is, you know, iPhone iPhone is just accessible, easy to use um, is, is what we would need. Um, and I could see that for like a walkthrough or a tech scout, Yeah. Um, you know, just Absolutely. do it on Zoom. And maybe it's just the director that needs to go. Maybe it's, you know, just two people instead of. Fa- FaceTime it. Mm-hmm. I just FaceTime a lot. Here, what, look at that. You like that? You like that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then we're done. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I think. And then I think mostly, I mean, I could see a lot with client, you know, is there a need if they can get, you know, playback to a certain you know, fees and things like, are there certain people that really are not going to want to fly or that don't have to be on set that those, those will probably be implemented. I could say that. The people on the set will be the people directly dealing that have to deal. Makeup has to be on set. Right. Right. Art has to be on set, but the director, the producer, no, I mean, and that's the thing that's the best about our business is that we actually 
are independent of each other and yet work as a team. Mm -hmm. You come on to any set. We all know what we have to do. Everybody says, hi, it looks like summer camp. Looks like we're not working. Everybody (laughs) knows what they have to do, whether the director's there or not. So that's why I think, you know, yeah, we're going to run into some problems. But of all of the businesses I see out there that have been affected by this, the restaurant business, the hotel and the travel business and all of these businesses, film and video is in one of the best places because just because of our attitude. Attitude is everything. It It really really is. is. It It is. is. Well, thank you so much to the three of you for being here this evening. And to close out, if you want to just kind of mention your socials or your websites, um, something to promote. I know, Robin, you want to mention your website and your program that you have, your course? Yes, I have a, if you want to break into the business, I have a five course series. Um, It takes you step by step and you you can become a production assistant. And learn, they'll, they'll, uh, you'll learn pretty much every job that's around because you'll be working with all the different departments and start your career. So you can check it out at www.kincaidproductions.com. I'm sure you guys will put it up there for me. Betsy? Uh, again, uh, we run a marketplace called Space for Arts. So spaceforarts.com um, and all of our social is at Space for Arts. So if you are looking for a beautiful professional production space, um, check it out or please reach out to me um, through info at Space for Arts and I will be happy to concierge and do my thing for you. Betsy, we do have one question for you specifically. Do okay. you have any plans on adding non-studio locations to your platform? Non-studio locations, like locations. <laughs> you know what? Um, I, get that, I get asked that a lot. And I think we need to make sure that we make this business sing and be really, really successful. Because one of the things that you can do is get really distracted with your business. And the location business is very different than the studio business. It's run differently. Um, we have many, many studio owners um, who run their business and then you've got location owners or location businesses where it's just the economics of that business are different. So the answer is, hmm, yes, that would be interesting and perhaps someday down the road, but for the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to do a really good job with what we've got. And, And when I say locations, I mean, we are adding like warehouses and rooftops and things Things like that, but not somebody's home, somebody's swimming pool. Not, yeah. So anyway, I hope that answered your question. But thank you, whoever asked that. <laughs> Gail? And then uh, you can reach me at liftproductions.com, and there'll be that's my website, uh, or Instagram. You can just lift, look for Lift Productions or Gail Katula. Um, lift Productions. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, guys. And thank you to our audience for tuning in once again to our shoots.video crew talk. And you can always find us on YouTube and uh, subscribe to the videos. This one should be up shortly. shortly. And again, I'm Sarah Marintz and you can find me at sarahmarintz.com. And we will see you next time. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. It's a pleasure. You might be looking at shoot stop video and thinking, so how does this all work? Is this about A, setting up the whole crew for me, B, just giving me options and having me handle it, or C, something in between? Well, it's D, all of the above. To put it simply, we're here to help you in any way that we can to get the crew and talent you need for your next production. We believe that every level of video production can benefit from a well-maintained list of qualified crew members for every position. This goes for pre-pro, on set, and for post. Every project is different, so if you need a producer to help manage the decision-making process, then we can totally do that. If you're already a producer and want to build your own crew from scratch, then go for it. We're here to make your next production a success. And if you are crew or talent looking for producers that want you, then you've come to the right place. Sign up now, and also leave a referral for any solid people that you know that are already on here. Thank you for considering ShootStop Video, and happy shooting!